good afternoon folks east coast time good morning folks west coast time and good evening good nightish folks india time because we do have an audience and audiences in india also thank you very much for joining in this is a saturday noon hour the 28th episode with the us india political action committee and the imagine india institute my name is robinder sachdev every week on a saturday noon we pick up topics of interest and passion of the indian american community be it within the domestic american policies or are also actually on us india relations this weekend we have a very interesting topic in fact i think several of us have, may have heard president biden's comments yesterday when he was interacting with the scientists at nasa saying that it seems that people of indian descent are taking over the country which he said half in jest and levity but anyway that was a interesting point that he made the topic for today is therefore indian americans in the biden administration where are we now where are we heading and an overall context of indian american participation in american domestic politics folks this is facebook live please keep your questions coming we'll be happy to take your questions we'll pass them on to our eminent panel and they'll be happy to factor in your questions in their comments we have a brilliant panel today of uh, practitioners leaders actually and practitioners uh from both sides of the aisle republican and democrat sides may I invite our panel onto the stage please thank you so much for joining we are waiting for two more panelists to be joining in a couple of minutes now till then we will be starting with us we have with us assembly women jennifer rajkumar who's a new york state assembly member thank you so much for joining us assembly women democrat of course we have with us mr sam shim who is the caucus chair of the rp caucus with the ohio democratic party thank you so much sam for joining us a pleasure to have you sir a pleasure to have both of our panelists with us today as we begin the first round uh the first round or the rather the format of this discussion is we are going in rounds one round two round three four rounds and then a wrap up round the opening round is always the opening thoughts of our distinguished panel on the topic of the day so let me begin with assembly women rajkumar your perspective on the topic of the day today which is talking about indian americans in the biden administration and may i also welcome adi sathi a republican strategist and policy professional thank you so much adi for joining us sir assembly women jennifer yours please your opening thoughts on the topic of the day uh, share with us why do you think that there's been so many it seems that a lot more people are of indian uh, american origin are joining uh participatory politics why is that happening or any highlight that you may wish to share yours please and of course welcome senator uh, senator antani thank you so much for joining us uh, from ohio state senate thank you so much this is the opening round opening thoughts from each panelist beginning with assembly women jennifer please thank you mr sachdev and good morning good night to all indian americans and indians all around the world and i'm so honored to be part of this illustrious panel with good friends including my old friend senator antani many congratulations on his tremendous victory so yes as our president said joe biden indian americans are taking over the country and he said it with his trademark humor but it definitely gets at a truth just within 50 days he has already appointed 55 indian americans to almost every wing of his his government is truly incredible including um miss mohan of nasa who was the first person to report that the rover perseverance had actually landed on the surface of mars and that really is a metaphor for all of the extraordinary work that the indian american community is now doing in government um also coming up is vivek murthy the nominee for surgeon general and uh, vanita gupta for associate uh, for associate attorney general and both of them have been stars in the community for a very very long time i can tell you as a young indian american i've been hearing about vivek and about vanita for years they have been people that i i know their families i've looked up to them for years so they really exemplify the best of our community hard working well educated dedicated to public service for years and they're part of a trend the trend of our community being on fire 
the Indian American community has discovered public service. We are now at the table of power in the country. And it is truly an exciting moment. I am proud to be a part of that wave. I'm the first Indian American woman to be elected to a government office in New York State, but I know I'm definitely not the last one. And I can tell you when I started my race last year, uh, people said this is impossible, but we, we won. We defeated an 11 year incumbent and we tripled turnout, engaging more people in the political process in this district than ever before. Um, and my victory is part of a larger trend all across this country, where you see Indian Americans uh, coming to public service in an extraordinary way, including, of course, our Vice President, Kamala Harris. Kamala Davy Harris, uh, who is the first Indian American to be elected to a national office. This is an incredible moment, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Jennifer. As you were talking, we did have a comment coming in from one of the audiences, Neil Gupta. He's saying, appreciate this conversation. Appreciate the Indian American leaders. Thank you for Mr. to Mr. Shim for his leadership in Ohio. He has another comment. So proud of all of you for uplifting the leadership and heart of our Indian American community. Thank you so much, Mr. Neil Gupta. The interaction and your comments is what kind of you know adds more punch and more liveliness to the discussion that we're having. Now, before I move on to uh, Senator Neeraj Antani, and do know that uh, Assemblywoman Jennifer, you have to kind of uh, run off for a, uh, you know another schedule right away. May I take a quick follow-up question with you, which would have other been, otherwise been the last question in this whole conversation. Sure, we have plenty of success. We are seeing a lot more participation. I wanted to ask you quickly, any lessons learned you think from the increasing number of folks, both on the Republican side, Democrat side, Indian Americans who are participating, any lessons learned, especially I would like to ask you, do you see any challenges or hurdles or any caution or red flags for you know increased participation in public service? The challenge is simply that we're new at this. So when you're new at this, you have to work hard. Uh, to get elected, I had to hustle. I worked very, very hard. Uh, there was nobody who had come ahead who could guide me. So we had to figure it out on our own. But I will say, I also see something tremendous, an advantage that Indian Americans have, a strength. And that is, we are so cross-cutting. We're able to unify people across ethnicities, across all income levels. Uh, that is a strength of, Indi of the Indian American community. In my own race, we were able to build a coalition across the Latino community, across South Asians, whether they were being from Bangladesh or from the Indo-Caribbean community, from India, we unified everybody. And we also unified people across ideology across the political spectrum, left and right. And I think it's, we were able to do this, but also you see Indian Americans doing it all across the country. We are incredible coalition builders. And I think that's what our politics needs right now. We need unity. We need people who can bring others together. And we are uniquely positioned to do that. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, both the points you highlighted that we are new to it. It's like pioneering. You know, you're first off uh, there. So it's like new territory, which we are traversing. And secondly, the point that you highlighted unity or being able to communicate or have empathy or cross connect with multiple cultures. Thank you so much for your time. And we do look forward if you're able to come back and join us towards the end. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Jennifer, please. We have another comment coming from Neil Gupta. He's saying, my hope is to bring all the Indian American leaders together to connect, inspire, and support one another. We need to be united. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your comments. Now, may I come to Mr. Senator Neeraj Antani from uh, Ohio State. Sir, your opening thoughts on the topic of the day, the Indian American community and Indian Americans in the US administration. That's the opening round, your first thoughts. And then we'll dig into deeper questions like I asked with Jennifer. That would be towards the end, you know, like what are the challenges we are seeing, et cetera. But first off, what are your, what is your overall take on the Indian American community's participation in the 2020 cycle? Well, you know, thank you. And, and thank you to US Impact for, for having me. I'm, I'm sorry, I was a few minutes uh, late running from another uh, appointment, but, you know, truly grateful for all everything US 
in fact does and uh, you know honored to be here as the first Indian American state senator in Ohio history and, and also the youngest Indian American elected official uh, in the country. Uh, but look, I'm glad that you know President Biden is continuing the legacy of, of Democrat and Republican presidents of continuing to appoint uh, more and more Indian Americans uh, to posts within the federal government. You know, we know that, you know, under the last Republican administration uh, that just took place, you know, we had a variety of Indian Americans. Ajit Pai, who was chair of uh, the Federal Communications uh, Commission. Neil Chatterjee, the chair of the Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, Seema Verma, director of Center for Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, Nikki Haley, obviously, ambassador to the UN. Uh, you know, Naomi Rao, uh, you know, in, in the regulatory office. And so, you know, I can go, you know, on and on about all of the Indian Americans that served in this past Republican administration, but also that served under George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush and, and on and on. And so, you know, I'm glad that, that President Biden is, is continuing uh, the legacy of, of other Republican and Democrat presidents of doing this. And, and I think, you know, some of this is just a marker of time. We know that, you know, as the youngest Indian American elected official in the country, I know that you know, as time marches on, more Indian Americans, uh, you know, are going to seek public service. Uh, and that, I think, is is being shown in the number of Indian Americans now being appointed. Th thank you so much for your thoughts uh, and your comments. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, this is going to be the question in the second round, which I'm going to come to, which you kind of already touched upon, sir. So we'll come to that. Thank you so much for your opening thoughts. May I now come to Mr. Sam Shim, uh, the caucus chair for the API uh democratic caucus uh, in the state of ohio so your opening thoughts please yeah. on the top of the day yes uh thank you again uh us impact for having me here today uh i think uh both uh jennifer and uh, senator antani have done a great job i don't want to reiterate this you know some, some of the points they made i think what's very exciting is be, regardless of political affiliation, we've seen so many more Indian Americans uh, getting involved in the political process. You know, obviously there was a lot of excitement with uh, Kamala Harris being the vice pres presidential candidate and before then when she was running for president. But, you know, even with the Trump administration, we saw a lot of Indian Americans in key positions. Uh, I think what it really shows to the country is that in the Indian American community is not a monolithic community. We have we have people from all across the political spectrum. And while we may differ somewhat on our positions and uh, uh, and our uh, where we stand on certain issues, our values are all the same. Uh, they they match up with a lot of the values of all the different immigrant communities and the Indian American community especially is able to build strong coalitions and they can connect with voters uh, who are both on the conservative side and on the progressive side and I think it really represents the strength of the Indian American community here in Ohio you know we're uh, we're uh, you know viewed as a purple state and we have Senator Antani which is wonderful i mean to have an indian a young indian american who has risen up to such a position of power you know in fact i remember meeting him back when he was in college and it does not seem that long ago you know it's great that we can all work together even if we even if we have different uh, stances on positions because we're trying to increase the diversity in politics and i think the other point i want to make jennifer did a great job of going through some of the appointees uh from the biden administration but let's not forget the uh, appoint the uh, uh, biden's pick for surgeon general is vivek murthy who was also the surgeon general under obama uh he's a great he's a great wonderful person uh, I've had the opportunity to spend time with them, and it's wonderful to see Indian Americans appointed to key positions in government uh, because I think diversity is our strength, uh, and I, I think that's something we all believe regardless of whether we are Democrat or Republican. Thank you so much, Sam, and absolutely, as you said, you know, Jennifer and Neeraj, they're, they're part you know, they're pioneering and pathbreaking in their own states, you know, the first, the youngest. And so, of, of course, you know, hearty congratulations and, you know, much happiness in that we all carry, uh, I think, within the wider Indian American community. And the other point that you mentioned, absolutely, you know, whichever side of the aisle, we have to have diversity, you know, 
be democ- uh, you know, progressive or conservative. Because if we all think the same, then we are clones. You know, we don't have any creativity. We have to have differences in, in order to spark creativity. Thank you so much, Sam, sir, for your thoughts. May I now invite Adi Sati, a Republican strategist and a policy professional, for your opening thoughts, sir, on the topic of the day, Indian Americans in the Biden administration. Overall, you can take, you can slice the salami any which way, sir. Well, Rabindo, thank you so much uh, for having me back. I uh, always enjoy being uh, here with you in the U.S. Impact and uh, uh, with Sam and, of course, uh, Niraj. I've also known since my college days because we were in college at the same time. Uh, so it's good to uh, see you both on here. And, um, you know, uh, to talk to uh, talk about Jennifer, even even though she's not here, uh, she really exemplifies what I think is the story of Indian Americans, people who are resilient, people who are willing to do uh, what uh, what they need to do to find that American dream. And uh, she herself has uh, been involved with politics, from what I understand, for the last uh, six to eight years. She had run for office on different occasions. But finally, uh, she came to that point where she never gave up and she ended up in the assembly. Uh, similar to uh, my friend, uh, Senator Nero Gentani. Uh, he started out in college uh, and uh, ended up ultimately in the state Senate uh, at the age of 29. I mean, these are impressive feats that you are starting to hear about. You're, you're starting to see uh, consistently throughout the Indian American community. When you talk about people in Washington, when we look on Capitol Hill even, which uh, has not been discussed so much, uh, every year I'm seeing more and more people uh, who are of Asian Pacific American origin, particularly Indian Americans in both Democrat and Republican offices. Uh, and when I was uh, on the Hill working for Senator Orrin Hatch, it was just not as common. So it's very happy. I'm very, I'm very happy to see that. Uh, and, and then, you know, when I was working at the Republican National Committee as the national director of Asian Pacific American engagement, uh, it was during the Trump uh, administration's uh, timeline and, and the presidency, especially in the first few years. And there were a lot of people that were getting great appointments. You were seeing a lot of visible people within the Indian American community. And then particularly, you saw folks uh, from that era that uh, supported uh, President Trump when he was down in Houston with the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and then also when he went to Ahmedabad, India back in 2020. Uh, and now there is a lot of momentum, uh, as well as a lot of question about what the U.S.-India relationship is going to be like. And that question is uh, still to be fully answered by the Biden administration. Of course, we're only here in March uh, after the inauguration in January. But many people in the Indian American community are hoping to see a continued growth in that relationship, uh, continued support for the efforts and initiatives of U.S.-India relations. Uh, and I think that U.S. impact is uh, hopefully going to be at the forefront of that conversation. So with all these new appointees, uh, some, some that have uh, made it through, some that uh, have unfortunately not made it through. I think it's going to be a, an exciting conversation today. Thank you so much, Ali. And uh, absolutely, you know, you, you highlighted quite a few points in terms of both within the domestic context and also in the context of U.S.-India relations, which also happens to be a, an area of interest to a large number of Indian Americans, of course, maybe not everyone, but a large number of Indian Americans are the kind of tracking the the trajectory of U.S.-India relations, which is going pretty good, actually, of course. But yeah, there are nuances with any administration or a change of administration. Thank you so much, sir, for your thoughts. Uh, folks, uh, whosoever is watching it on the U.S.-India Political Action Committee Facebook page, Imagine India Facebook page, please keep your questions coming, your comments coming. That helps us to engage our distinguished panel more. And you can pick their brains and get their views, learn from or share, uh, let, ask them to share their experiences. Oh, okay, fine. Here, we have a question coming in. Thank you. Uh, Neil Gupta says, question, how is US Impact planning to leverage the latest Indian American appointees to bring the community together? What can be done while there is enthusiasm and a prominent number of leaders? Thank you so much, Neil. Sir, uh, I would actually uh, put this question to our panel because in this panel discussion, we invite views from our panelists rather than what US Impact or Imagine India is doing. In these uh, discussions, we act more as a platform to bring together the views. But I think your question absolutely applies. And I will request our uh, panelists to keep this in mind when they're, we move into the second round, beginning with Senator Altani. The question is that how can we leverage, not US impact, let's say broadly, how, how can uh, the latest Indian American appointees be leveraged, the number, to bring the community together? Great point. We'll come to that, sir. Now, may I invite uh, Senator Antani? For the second round, a question, and of course, you can all factor in 
what uh, Neil was asking. My question is that two things. Why are we seeing, it seems, increasing levels of Indian American participation or let's say Asian, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander also, of course, participation in American politics or public service. Why are we seeing, I mean, there seems to be quite an increase actually, both in elected as well as in policy positions, as you can well see, you know, on Capitol Hill and the legislative aides and stuff like that. Why are we seeing that? That's one. And second, my question to you, Neil, uh, Senator Antani, would be that how can this momentum be grown? How can this momentum keep be grown or given some more impetus? Yours, please, sir. Sure. Thank you, Ruben. There, you know, well, let me answer Neil's question first. You know, I, I think obviously, you know, any Indian American in a state, in a sorry, in a federal agency, so used to the state level, uh, in a federal agency can be helpful to, to Indian Americans, right? Uh, you know, when when different constituent issues come up or you know, visa issues, et cetera, you know, having of our community uh, is incredibly important. Uh, and that's how, you know, we can sort of, you know, connect and, and use, you know, those in the federal government to be helpful to, to our community. To ask, to answer your question, uh, Ruben, there, you know, look, I'm a believer that you know, this is really following a very natural progression right the uh were the immigrant generation right they came and 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 had to survive uh the next wave of, of immigrants or the next generation their their kids uh they thrive and that's where we are now and then the next wave uh is where you start seeing you know those getting involved in in different societal functions right running for mm -hmm. elected office serving in uh, the government uh, and that's where we are now and so i really think you know, uh, after, you know, my generation, uh, which I think is the tip of the spear uh, in that issue, you know, we're now going to see uh, sort of a huge ballooning. And I think you're already seeing that, you know, I was the first elected official in the country uh, that was born in the 1990s uh, that was sworn in. And so I think, you know, now you're going to sort of see this, you know, balloon and balloon more, but really, I think it's a natural progression. Now, how can we help? Obviously, look, I'm uh, an elected official, you know, you can donate to Indian American candidates, you can uh, vote for Indian American candidates. You can volunteer for Indian American candidates. Uh, and, and that is, you know, really what is necessary to help. And our community does a great job of it, uh, but we can obviously always do more. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. So, I mean, uh, so you, you, your perspective is that this is the tip of the spear or it's more like a hockey stick coming up. So we'll be seeing a lot more participation from the Indian American community uh, in public service. That's very heartening to know. And uh, great perspective, you know, uh, to contribute to the society wherein we serve, we live. Thank you so much, Senator Antani. And absolutely, yes, uh, uh, what can be done further to support us? Yeah, definitely, you know, uh, help out in funds, help out in getting out the votes, campaign, communication, volunteering, and all such, which every Indian American or any political candidate needs. So folks who serve is listening to, to this discussion, do keep that in mind whenever the next election cycle is coming around that watch out, look out for Indian American candidates and do see that howsoever, whichsoever manner in which you can contribute or, you know, lend your shoulders to this momentum. Thank you so much, Senator Anfani. May I now uh, invite uh, Mr. Samshin. Similarly, for your views, why are you seeing this increased participation from, let's say, the Indian American community and what can be done to further this momentum? I think, uh, Senator, Senator Antani had described it well. It, it very much describes the growth of the Indian American community here in Ohio and across the country. Uh, just like with my parents, uh, as the first generation of immigrants, they struggled to make sure the basic needs were met. They wanted to make sure we had food and clothing and shelter. And then they tried to figure out how to assimilate uh, to American culture and understand the nuances of being American. Uh, you know, if you study, if you take a psychology point of view, there's the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and they were focused on the very basic needs. Uh, at, at us being the next generation, we are going beyond the typical stereotypical jobs that are common, you know, the doctors and the attorneys and the engineers. And uh, because our basic needs are met in, in our household, we're able to think and, and, and uh, uh, study in college and uh, be in careers that are more 
beyond a kind of a basic needs job. I think it really reflects on the growth and success of the Indian American community. If you look at the income level across America, Indian Americans, uh, their uh, median income is far higher than a typical uh, American median income. And that really is a reflection of the strong core values uh, in the Indian American community. I think another reason why we see more Indian Americans getting involved in politics is also because as the first generation when they there was this perpetual foreigner myth uh, where we were all foreigners if we were not white. But uh, as that myth is going away, you know, you can be Indian American, but you are just as American as someone from Europe or any other part. So our ability to be part of the American culture has grown, you know, tremendously. And I think that's helped uh, get, provide more opportunities uh, for Indian Americans and for all of the immigrant communities in our country. Uh, as for how to keep helping out, I think, you know, on the progressive side here, we also have great organizations that help train uh, Indian American uh, candidates to run for office. Uh, here uh, in Ohio, here in, in Columbus specifically, there are several Indian Americans that are running for office in the first time. I mean, we see we, most people don't see Ohio as a diverse state, yet, you know, we have Senator Antani and so many other people that are able to break through, you know, this glass ceiling, or, you know, they call it the bamboo ceiling under the uh, AAPI community and run for office and succeed regardless of whether we live in a more conservative or more progressive area of the state. And there are wonderful groups such as APEX, APAICS, and New American Leaders that help train uh, Indian Americans and other immigrants, first and second generation immigrants to run for office. So in addition to supporting candidates who are in office and supporting people who are in office, uh, there are also wonderful groups uh, who citizens can help support and continue this, uh, this groundswell of Indian Americans running for office for the first time, and in many cases succeeding the first time they run. Uh, it, it's amazing to see all this leadership in the community, and it really reflects on the the value, the American values that we all share, because we want to be part of the American uh, society and be a part of government. We want to be part of the solution, and we want to have a seat on the table, and I think it, it, the Indian American community has done a wonderful job, and it makes me so proud here in Ohio. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, uh, uh, before I move on to Adi, I think uh, with the question on this round, I think between Senator Antani and Sam, uh, they've kind of captured the nuances or the big picture of you know why we are seeing increase in participation and what more could be done, including of course Maslow's hierarchy, and you know uh, uh, the comfort of beyond being the first uh, you know first wave of immigrants and immigration. So therefore, I'll kind of put a twist to this tale in the question to you, Adi. I'll ask you that within this context, let's say you're with a political party, be it the progress, Republican or Democrat, let's say you're with Republicans, right? What would you do to, let's say, if not groom, nurture, let's say, X number of grassroots leaders within your party or what is happening or what do you think could be done, should be done, let's say, to have 20 more state legislators of Indian origin, Indian descent, affiliated to the Republican Party or in the U.S. Congress. What do you think would be done, could be done, should be done? Well, let me start by clarifying that I identify with the Republican Party. And yes. then uh, let me also cool. say that in the Republican Party, we have, of course, the RNC. And then underneath that, we have what we call sister committees uh, that are focused on the Senate, the House, the governor's races, the attorney general's races. And then also there's an organization called the Republican State Leadership Committee, uh, which is focused on the state legislative races that includes the state house and the state senate. To answer your question, within that organization, there's actually an entity uh, that is very dedicated to recruiting minority and women candidates all throughout this country. And effectively, they have been in all of these spaces. They have done a really good job of that even in 2020. And if you look at what has been accomplished by the Republican Party, particularly in 2020, uh, they not only maintained every state legislature, uh, but they also gained uh, state legislatures, in particular in New Hampshire, for example. And that is a testament to the recruitment of some of these candidates. And then when you take it more specifically into the Indian American space, 
when you look at people all across the country that are thinking about what it's going to take to especially win seats, whether that's federal or state, uh, when it comes to the suburban communities of America, that is where a significant population of the Indian American community or broader Asian Pacific American community tends to live. I'm from Michigan. Uh, so in Metro Detroit, you actually have three state legislatures, legislators now of Indian origin, all three are Democrats, uh, and they all live in or around Metro Detroit. I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and uh, that I think is indicative of the population, but also the way that both parties are looking at folks that can not only raise money, that can also speak well about their party's platform and the issues that matter to them, but also are able to bring a unique constituency of voters to the table. And when we think about Indian American voters, yes, they are new to the system to an extent. Uh, many of them are first time voters, especially in 2020 or 2016. Uh, maybe they're more focused on presidential elections. But if you actually put a person that looks like them with a name that they recognize that is from their own community, they're more likely to vote regardless of what the party affiliation might be. And that probably applies to many immigrant com communities. But I think when it comes to particularly the Indian American community, they're very loyal to their community. And we're seeing more candidates emerge because of this. You're also seeing a large component of people who are thinking about public service from a younger age. Their parents are not just telling them, look, you have to be a doctor or an engineer. Uh, they're saying, look, you can do more than that. You can join the military. You can become a public servant. You can go to law school. You can do certain things that were not part of the original traditional norm of success for Indian Americans in this country. And that is also, I think, what's bringing more people into the fold, both in the Democrat and Republican parties. And that ultimately leads to people thinking about it from a younger age, which means, well, what can I do to present myself either as a, a good behind the scenes operator? Uh, what kind of campaigns can I work on to get my name out there? Or how can I posi position myself to be a good candidate for public office? And all of these thoughts are now more so on the forefront. When I worked on Capitol Hill, I worked for a senator named Senator Orrin Hatch, I mentioned. He's now retired, longest serving senator in the history of America on the Republican side. And he served for 42 years. He came from Utah, where there is a very large population of Mormons, Mormon uh, people of uh, Mormon faith. And uh, when you think about that population particularly, I noticed that they had about 2.5% of the population in America, percentage-wise. But at that time, they had five or six senators in the United States Senate. That's five or six percent of, Amer of, of uh, the American vote. And uh, they were able to figure out how to do that by being smart, by being tactful. I think the Jewish American community gets a lot of similar credit. And now when you look at the congressional delegation, you're seeing a significant number of Indian Americans that are currently in Congress. I think that number is going to continue to grow. You saw many candidates that were very close that may not have won this cycle, but they may run again. And I hope that people like State Senator Narajantani will also consider continuing to serve in a public capacity and maybe will also be one of these members of the federal delegation of Congress. So I think Thank that we'll see more and more people moving forward. Mm -hmm. Sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adi. In fact, there's a comment coming in uh, from Neil Gupta. Neil seems to be following the conversation very diligently. Thank you, sir, for following and being with us. He says, I wholeheartedly agree with the words from Adi. Thank you so much, Neil, for your thoughts and comments. Uh, now, uh, while you were talking, Adi, I was reminded Senator Orrin Hatch was one of the first senators we met way back in 2002 when we started the U.S. India Political Action Committee. We used to do a series known as Breakfast on the Hill. So I think every week or if we could manage maybe every fortnight, we would do a breakfast meeting with senators. I remember even Chuck Grassley and all. But Orrin Hatch was one of the first ones we had met. So, yeah, that brings up some memories you know, of old times. Thank you so much. Uh, now, may I come to uh, Neeraj Antani? And before coming uh, to, to Senator Antani, there was another question which we got from email. Folks, whosoever is watching, please do keep your questions or comments coming. Uh, we got some questions. Uh, this is live right now, but we got some questions on email also once folks knew that, you know, I mean, uh, for this session today. So Dr. Ajay Kothari from Astrox uh, Space Company mentions that Trump did not put any Indian American in a senior position in NASA, despite many of us trying very hard. Shouldn't Biden administration put some folks of Indian American origin in senior positions at NASA? Uh, Dr. Kothari, I think uh, uh, this is uh, already, I mean, some of it, like if you follow uh, last week's, you know, the perseverance at Mars mission and all, it seems Indian Americans are there a lot, of course, already in NASA. But thank you so much for your comment and your question. Now, may I come to Senator Antani? Uh, 
one i would uh, see let's take some uh, it always helps you know people relate and we all relate and absorb more from personal stories so the question we have in this round is that what is the if not let's say the usual path but what are the paths to leadership for people of indian descent okay and let's say as a case study with you so i mean you can look at it from two perspectives one in your own analysis what have you seen as the path uh, hi welcome sir uh, assemblywoman uh, jennifer thank you for joining us back okay uh, so, so sir antani so what do you see are the usual if not usual but the paths normally what people take to rise go from grassroots to elected positions and secondly if you can share with us your own path also quickly to highlight thank you please well thank you and, and let me thank my friend dr uh, ajit kothari for that question it is a good question you know i know we know you know dr swati mohan obviously made you know national news in the past few weeks and i know she's been there throughout a variety of administrations but you know certainly you know we should seek to to have senior uh, indian americans in, in every you know state agency um but look you know i think that the, the path for elected office or appointed office is is uh, quite simple it, it it's a lot of hard work and, and dedication uh to uh, the cause now you know i think there's two paths for uh sort of appointed office right you can uh you know go into your professional field uh and then eventually uh you know switch over to um you know government service right you can make a, a professional uh you know life and then switch to government service or you can go straight into you know government service and and spend you know your time rising through the ranks for elected office you know i'll be very frank um and you know the problem you know many indian americans have is they run straight for the u.s senate or they try to run straight for governor or straight for the u.s congress uh and and frankly it doesn't work out well for our community um you know number one they often lose um you know we know that there's only four now uh, indian americans in congress uh you know uh, but, but you know, Roger Krishnamurthy, who's a dear friend of mine, he ran for many offices before and lost. Ro Khanna ran for his seat multiple times and lost. And so, you know, it took him a while to get there. Uh, you know, Pramila Jayapal was, was in the state legislature. And 49% of Congress, 49% of Congress were state legislators. They were delegates. They were assembly members. They were state senators. Uh, and so one in two members of Congress were, were, were in the state legislature. And then when you count, you know, county executives, county commissioners, you know, mayors, other public officials, you're talking 70, 75, 80 percent of Congress were in, you know, local or state government offices. And so, you know, our community, frankly, needs to stop running uh, for the Senate, you know, straight off the bat or governor or Congress straight off the bat, uh, because frankly, it's a little embarrassing because they lose and they lose badly. And that looks badly upon you know, our community. And so. You know, that's that's number one is is run for, you know, local or state office first and then use that uh, as 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 a, a way to, to run for, you know, higher office. Other than that, you know, it, it, it's, you know, very much hard work and, and dedication uh, and, and working hard every day. You know, Jennifer, right, my friend Jennifer here uh, ran and lost prior, uh, but kept at it and then unseated an incumbent. And, and that, you know, is, I think, a testament to you know, work ethic, which our community, you know, has plenty of. Thank you so much, Senator Antani. I think you raise a, or you highlight a very pertinent point that it's the local politics and from local to graduate up. And if I'm not mistaken, in the last 2020 presidential, congressional and local, probably there were around 200 folks of Indian origin running for various elected offices, you know, various elected positions. So which is a good number. I mean, uh, the, we don't have a exact total there. If you have any of you have any estimate, I would love to know. But that itself was a good number. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Antani. We have a comment coming in from uh, Neil Gupta again. Thank you so much, Neil. He's saying that I am a school district administrator. Mr. Shim is one of my board members. Ah, you see. So his point is, how can Indian Americans be representative on committees at the state and national level? to leverage their voice and insights. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gupta. I think that's exactly somewhat uh, what Senator Antani was referring to, that you know uh, more representation on committees uh, at the state and local levels, and then graduating or moving up to 
the, 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 the national level. We also have a comment coming in from a good colleague, uh, Santino R. Thomas, uh, wherein he says, a very impressive feat by Assemblywoman Rajkumar to unseat an entrenched incumbent in New York State, especially in New York City. Thank you so much, Santino, for uh, informing us all and our viewers of this achievement of Assemblywoman Jennifer. Congratulations once again on that feat. Uh, thank you so much. We also have a comment coming in from uh, Rajiv Dhaparkar, who is saying Richa Gautam. Maybe he's referring or referencing uh, someone other in the audience to be watching this show as such. Folks, kindly keep your comments and questions coming. We'll be more than happy to take. And our distinguished panel, as you can see, their experience, expertise, and uh, their views would be really interesting for the present and the future also. That's it. May I now move to uh, Assemblywoman Rajkumar once again. Uh, uh, in this round, the question that we're having, man, is that what is the usual path in your perspective? What you see of various Indian origin candidates who've gone into electoral politics, what are the usual paths they've taken? If you can, you know, have a summary or I wouldn't say a cookie cutter, but some perspective on that. And secondly, what has been your specific path? Because you see, at times, individual stories, as uh, Senator Antani was mentioning also, individual stories relate more to the audiences. And our intent in this discussion is, of course, also to inspire and ignite folks who are listening and joining into this discussion. So two part question quickly. Uh, one part is, what do you see the overall trend? How do folks get to participate or grow up? Uh, into electoral offices or in uh, appointed offices, one. And second, your own personal case as a case study, please. So I started my career as a civil rights attorney because what I wanted to do was help everybody who was vulnerable, domestic violence victims, immigrants, whoever needed a voice. That was my career. Then along the way, I realized if you really want to make a difference, you need power. So I took a total 180 and I got politically involved. But I started in much the same way that Senator Antani advocates for. I started locally. I started uh, and I ran for a district leader position in New York, which is a very local position when I was 28. And at that time, I ran against a 28 year incumbent. They said, you're a nice girl, but you have no shot. <laughs> but we won. We won through a grassroots effort. Uh, I knocked on every door in the district. And I met everybody. I went to public housing. I went to luxury buildings. I met people across ethnicities. And I spoke to them one by one. And that's how I won that race. I stood on a street corner. And I just stood there every day. And I met all the neighbors who passed by. And people wondered, who is that? Why is that girl just standing there? Is she OK? Is there an issue? Um, and then people began to respect it because I was there every day. And it was a very humble act to just stand on a corner. And it's that kind of humility that I think you need to be a true public servant. Um, so it's, it's approaching public service with a truly uh, humble spirit, because that's what service is all about at the end of the day. Yes, you are trying to attain a powerful position, but it's all so that you can make a difference for people. Um, so I, I believe that it is it is very good to start locally if you can, um, because you learn so much and you have to talk to everybody one at a time. Those experiences have shaped me. The voices of people that I've met are always in my head because I know what people are going through because I've talked to them one at a time. Um, I also respect many Indian Americans that have appointed positions. I myself was appointed later uh, the governor of New York appointed me to direct immigration for New York State. So I was a governor appointee in New York State. And that experience took me from my home in South Queens all the way to the farmlands by the Canadian border and really broadened my horizons. I got to meet people of so many different perspectives. So uh, I feel very, I feel very lucky to have had such a diversity of experiences now to bring in service to my constituents. So the pathways are many. Uh, you can start locally. You can become appointed to a position. Um, I think what is most important in all of this is to bring with you a, a humble spirit, because this is, after all, service. 
Now, other people in our community, uh, they have run for Congress. Uh, some people have run for Congress many times and then made it. And I applaud that because it shows persistence. No matter what route you take to get to a government position, whether it's running and losing, um, running again and winning, whether it is uh, being appointed to a position, it takes persistence. And you have to be guided by your passion. You have to really want it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblywoman. In fact, when you were mentioning, you mentioned the word persistence and perseverance a couple of times. I was reminded that perseverance can take you to Mars, right? And uh, that's what perseverance and, you know, and the other point that you mentioned about, you know, service. And, I mean, yes, uh, leadership is service, you know, service as leadership, the true sense of that service to the people, service to, I mean, a planet as such or to the common humanity. Thank you so much for your thoughts. But I had a trailing question therein, you know, uh, uh, and would be lo lovely to hear your views on that. Uh, Neera Tandon, her appointment recently, right, which ran into some uh, opposition and some, you know, we all know where it is. Well, she also exhibited perseverance, right, didn't she? Uh, and she also, from her perspective, took service, right, and delivered service. So what is your take on the controversy uh, or or the situation which developed with the, with the appointment of Neera Tandon? It's never easy. Public service is never easy. Uh, there are ups and downs. We have not seen the last of Neera Tandon, that's for sure. Uh, even despite this setback, she's a very talented woman. Um, with a track record that's incredible. And even the Biden administration has even said they will make a position for her. They will make a place for her, even though uh, she won't be the OMB um, head. Uh, I, you know, I do think that she is someone that has been loyal. She was attacked for some of her statements on Twitter, which people said were divisive. That may be so. Um, however, we can't argue with the fact that she has been very loyal to the people that she has worked for. She worked for Hillary Clinton and was very loyal to Hillary. And I think people on both sides of the aisle can respect loyalty. I do. Um, so I know that she's going to keep working. She's going to be a public servant. In, pu in public service, there are ups and downs and setbacks. And this is one of them. And you know, she is a, a Indian woman a woman of color, and you have to fight for everything. Um, to win my race, it was a fight. Uh, so there are ups and downs. You don't win every battle, but we haven't seen the last of her, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Uh, I think very wise comments, of course. You know, like we haven't, of course, seen the last of her, absolutely. And this is politics. There are ups and downs out there. Thank you so much for your thoughts. We have uh, Leslie commenting that uh, Neera Tandon is an asset. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your thoughts and comments. Thank you so much. We also have Ajay, Dr. Ajay Kothari, uh, who had asked the question earlier about, you know, more Indian Americans and senior positions in, in NASA during Trump administration. He says that they were trying, but can there be more during the Biden administration? He is saying that great panel, very thoughtful, articulate and comprehensive discourse. It has been nice to know you, Neeraj, Adi and Jennifer. Proud of you all. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course, Sam, Ajay, you missed. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your questions and comments which are coming in. Let's keep on getting more questions. May I now move to uh, Sam Shim. Same question overall. Your personal anecdote uh, as to how you reach this leadership position where you are, one. And then secondly, quick perspective. I also want your take on, on if not Neera Tendon, any other controversial appointees you see in the Biden administration. That's the second part, a footnote of it, but the main chunk or uh, which we would love to hear from you is your story, which you can share with us, our viewers, please, sir. Great. Uh, thank you again uh, for the question. I think for me, how I got involved in politics is right before I ran for office, the year before, we have a system here in Ohio where school districts have to pass levies in order to continue their funding. It's, it's a strange system that's hard to explain uh, to people from other parts of the country. Uh, the way it works is we pass tax levies and over time as home values rise, they collect less and less. So we need to, we need to uh, add 
additional tax levies every three to five or six years to offset inflation and to offset the decrease in how much we collect. Uh, so I got involved in a school levy campaign here in my district, and there was uh, three of us that led the campaign. Uh, so it was very helpful kind of understanding the dynamics of the community and also just meeting a broad cross spectrum of people. And I think that's what's so important uh, for a lot of us who get into politics is we are we are just meeting with people across our across our communities. It's not just our immediate community, but it's people uh, of different ethnicities, uh, people of different genders. Uh, it's just people in different social economic status. It helps broaden us and it allows us to develop uh, coalitions and then to work very collaboratively. Uh, I think regardless of whether someone is a Democrat or Republican, running for office is a very patriotic act. It shows a dedication to America and, and it shows you know their willingness to provide service uh, to our country. Because often we make a lot of personal sacrifices uh, when we run for office. Uh, we, ch we chose a career path you know, that can be a lot more uh, stressful and a career path that may not be as, 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 as financially beneficial. So you know, I, I give credit to anyone who runs for office. I think uh, one of the ways we see, one of the reasons why we see more Indian Americans running for office is we see more Indian Americans stepping up to be community leaders. And I think that's so important. Uh, it, allows, uh, it allows your voice to be heard and your name to be recognized. And that's so important. We also have more training programs available to Indian Americans that, that run for office. As I mentioned before, there's APEX, uh, which is A-P-A-I-C-S dot org, and there's New American Leaders. So we have training programs that specifically help immigrant communities uh, run for office because often we don't have the experience and we don't have the generational knowledge that that is common with some other groups. And you know, I, my apologies uh, to my colleague here in Michigan. Uh, one of the states that I've done a lot of volunteer work for is in Michigan. And in addition to having several uh, Democratic people and in, uh, Democratic Indian Americans in the legislature, Last year, we brought a lot of victories, especially in Southeast Michigan, in the school board area and library boards. Uh, so having these training programs and having opportunities to find mentors that look like us or very similar to us, I think has really helped uh, Indian Americans run for office. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, Nera Tandon, you know, the, the thing that I struggle with is what if she was a white male? Because uh, I feel that because she's a woman and because she is a person of color, that she was judged more harshly than other people can be judged. If she was not Indian American, I do not believe uh, her appointment would have been stopped. You know, I do sense that there is still some, some element of uh, privilege that still exists in the political process. And unfortunately, she was a victim of that. Uh, but we have not seen the last of her. She will still have a key spot. And I am looking forward to you know, the wonderful work she will continue to do. She's been, a, she's been an inspiration to so many people, especially us behind the scenes in the political community. And uh, you know, she, she, there's more to come with her. Well, you know, I, I like to push back on that you know, a little bit, Sam. Uh, you know, frankly, you know, I appreciate the, the partisan talking point, but, um, you know, I, I really think that it's it's quite wrong. You know, nearly every senator was the same, except for, you know, obviously John Ossoff and, and Raphael Warnock. But but most of the Republican senators who were there, you know, that confirm Trump's cabinet were there for this. And, and let's remember, those Republican senators voted for Nikki Haley, an Indian American woman. They voted for Seema Verma, for director of CMS, an Indian American woman. They voted for Seema Rao for the Office of Regulatory Affairs, an Indian American woman, uh, and on and on and on. They voted for Naomi Rao, I'm sorry, not Seema Rao, Naomi Rao, an Indian American woman. And I can just rattle off you know, a, a, a whole lot of, of Indian American women that, that those Republican senators voted for. And so that is not the reason they oppose Neera Tandon. Let's remember that Joe Manchin opposed Neera Tandon, a Democrat. Uh, you know, President Biden couldn't even get his 
own party to support her nomination. Look, Nero's a friend. Nero called me. I called Senator Portman on Nero's behalf uh, to try to advocate for her as a fellow Indian American, not because I agree with her, but as a fellow Indian American. But, you know, to, to try to make this a, a racial or gender issue uh, to me is a partisan attack and you're attacking your own party. Uh, and so I don't think that's a very productive way. I don't think that moves our country forward. I don't think it brings our country together. You know, Joe Biden is supposed to be the, the president of unity, uh, but that's not a very unified argument. Thank you, Senator Antani. Uh, Sam, you can have a quick uh, reparty because then, I mean, uh, the, the, the conversation ha will move to Adi. So a quick uh, rejoinder if you want to give a short one, please. Sure. You know, I, I would, uh, I think we would agree to disagree on that. I think yeah, her enough. tweets would not have been an issue if she was a white male. And I will just leave it at that to give everyone else time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughts. Absolutely welcome. Now, may I move to uh, Adi Sati. Same question to you overall. Uh, can you share some bit of your personal story, how you became, came to be where you are as a leader within the community, within the party where you are? Uh, if you can kindly share quickly your thoughts on, uh, and is that the path? Because what I'm trying to tease out, you know, each one of you has kind of similar, but at the same time, very dissimilar paths towards where you're headed. And that's where a lot of future Indian American and even in the present, you know, uh, potential aspirants would be looking at and who are listening to this conversation would take their cues. And thank you, for, folks. Please keep your questions coming. We do have a couple of comments coming in. I'm sorry I missed them out. One was Bijender Singh saying, good one. Thank you, Bijender. Good one. Good for you. Good of you to say it's a good one. Welcome. Uh, his question was, how do you describe Joe Biden's statement that Indian Americans are taking over the United States? Uh, thank you, Bijender. But I think you joined maybe a bit late in the conversation. We've gone through that discussion earlier i think more or less if not taking over the point is that folks are getting very much more involved and participatory within american public service and then we had leslie uh, mentioning thank goodness deb Haaland was confirmed thank you leslie for your comment so much may i move now to adi your thoughts sir on your journey and uh, what do you see is a typical path or can be a typical path for more participation by the indian american community in public service and public affairs in the united states so first and foremost, I think that uh, what's most interesting about everybody on this uh, panel is that they took a non-typical path. Uh, a lot of what they did was uh, figuring out, figuring it out as they went along. They ran for different things. They got involved with their parties. They, uh, they challenged uh, the opposition. They continued to fight and fight. And so um, I think that those are actually pretty non-traditional pathways. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's, these are wrong paths. I think if anything, um, they're, they're more unique, but, uh, I also did not have a particular mentor of any kind, uh, maybe another Indian American person or another person I could look up to who was, you know, established in politics in that way to really, uh, you know, help guide, uh, me in the direction that I wanted to go in. And now, you know, now that I know what I know, I think I'd be more than happy to help people and I've, and I've done my best to do so. But, uh, for my own original path of coming out of um, college and doing student government that then led to campaign oriented work. Uh, when I was finishing graduate school at the University of Michigan, um, I didn't uh, get a chance to run for public office, but I had an opportunity to run for a statewide party office in Michigan uh, to be the vice chairman of the Republican Party. There are six vice chairs for the Michigan uh, party here uh, for the GOP. And at the time, it was during the 2016 election cycle. It was a statewide convention campaign. And uh, ultimately, after campaigning, I was elected uh, to serve in that capacity. And it just so happened to be in a year where a Republican presidential candidate had won the state of Michigan uh, for the first time since 1988, uh, which that within itself was a great moment to be part of that team. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, then selected Ronna McDaniel uh, to be the RNC chairwoman. She was previously the Michigan chairwoman uh, during that timeline uh, when he first got elected. And so when she became the RNC chairwoman uh, as her vice chair in Michigan, I had the opportunity to, to join her there at the RNC where I served as the national director of Asian Pacific American engagement for uh, about a year and a half, two years. And uh, in between that, I had the chance to work for Senator Orrin Hatch and it was actually through APAX, which is the organization that uh, Sam mentioned earlier, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies uh, that essentially set up this uh, fellowship opportunity. So I got to touch Capitol Hill, got to work at the uh, national party headquarters and I got elected to statewide party office in Michigan. Those are probably the, the bigger highlights of my political career so far, but a lot of what I've been able to do is work on campaigns uh, that included in Georgia most recently when I was down there during this 
uh, special election, uh, runoff election that happened uh, after uh, the November 3rd uh, election. And, uh, you know, even before that, just had a chance to travel all throughout the, all throughout the country. Something that I do want to point out about some of the folks here, particularly in Ohio and New York, uh, these are states that uh, many don't realize have very tough elections for state legislative uh, races and for local races. Not every state has the same process. And so I really want to commend the folks that are on this panel because the pathway that they took was even harder than if they were, let's say, in New Hampshire or, or a smaller state like that, where there's a much faster pathway to you know, having electoral glory, if you want to put it that way. But when it comes to uh, people that are uh, behind the scenes and then working in the federal government, uh, as appointees in uh, both Republican and Democrat administrations. Not all of them are Senate confirmed appointees, and that's where you may see Nara Tenen's name pop up again because there could be a space for her, even at the White House or in a different part of the administration where she doesn't have to face the wrath of the Senate in the process of nominating uh, her and, and ultimately getting confirmed and all that. That doesn't always exist. In this particular case, I, I do want to point out something uh, that I think is very interesting, especially after the Georgia elections that we saw where the outcome is that the uh, Senate is 50-50, uh, Republican, Democrat. And that uh, means that Chuck Schumer uh, is maintaining being the majority leader. And uh, in this particular case, of course, the Republicans are going to push back on pretty much any nominee uh, that comes through from a Democrat administration. And in particular, near attendance, spent a lot of time at the Center for American Progress, where she was ahead of that organization, which is a think tank, a very left-leaning think tank um, that has uh, you know progressive ties to a lot of different entities within the Democratic uh, apparatus. And I think that was a uh, part of the uh, reason that there was a pause on the Republican side, which I think very, makes very much sense. Uh, what mm -hmm. we really don't recognize always is the reason that she's ultimately not being able to get confirmed is not because of the Republican Party, but because of a member of her own party in Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who because of this 50-50 split and have it, happening to be a moderate is part of the reason that he came out against her nomination and so it's really something that I think people may not recognize when you read articles. I've read many articles that say she was not able to get enough support from the Republicans. It's really not the Republicans. It's really a member of her own party, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, who was the first one that came out and said he could not support her based on her history and her background and her time spent at the Center for American Progress and her tweets and, and, and so on. So I think that, uh, you know, that's something that people don't always point out, especially not the media. And I just want to bring light to that. Sure. Thank you so much, Adi. Um, I think the takeaway from this round, when I started and requested you to highlight your own, you know, your, your stories and your anecdotes is that, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty in the sense that if you look back, it would be said, generically speaking, hard work, perseverance, <laughs> persistence, etc. I mean, that's, you know, the, the, that sounds cliche. But what came out also, as you mentioned, that for each person, the path to hard work is different, you know the path to persevere is different and what ignites you and what kind of you know triggers your passion more and what really gets you going and to jump in and say that yes i want to do i want to participate uh, so there are different triggers and i think for each person here on this panel and each uh, person who's listening uh, in the audiences or in the future whoever would be they'll have their own triggers so essentially you know sharing our stories helps us to kind of build that community or that sense of community that we are fellow journeyers. Our, our views and ideologies may be different, but we value diversity. And the more diversity, let a thousand flowers bloom and let the best, you know, come out forth. Thank you so much, folks. Now we move into the last round. Uh, before we do that, folks, once again, whosoever is listening, watching, uh, come on by, check on by, be in the United States, be in India wherever or even in other parts of the world, because we do have some viewers who are logging in from other parts of the world also. Please put in your question or comments for our distinguished panel, as you can see, uh, which has been sharing the fantastic stories. Uh, now, may I uh, start with Senator Antani for the last round? Uh, I have two parts in this question. One is that, OK, the second part would be that any wrap up, any perspective you would want to share, right? Overall, as we wrap up your closing comments, that would be your closing comments. But A, before that, what would you identify or say that, of course, we've heard that there are challenges, there are hurdles and all, but are there any caution? Is there any caution you would like to share or red flags? I'm not saying do's and don'ts, but something like that, especially for the Indian American community as they get into electoral politics or as they go deeper into public service or appointed office 
are there i mean even for example maybe neera tandon's case could be an example it just struck me right uh, could be but let's move away from that so are there any such you know lessons learned over the years that uh, do's and don'ts so something on the don'ts when you're getting into electoral politics out there and then your closing thoughts please sir well you know again i, I think we covered the the do's with you know hard work and perseverance yeah. and you know how to get into appointed office oh, it's office. the don'ts but you know as, as far as the don'ts go look i i think it's the same that um you know if 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 you are thinking of running for the u.s senate or governor or congress and you've never held elected office before just don't save our community the heartache save our community the money don't do it you will not win right uh it just won't happen uh i mean there are literally three who have ever done it uh out of now hundreds who have tried hundreds of indian americans who've run for congress or governor of the u.s senate and they have all lost just don't do it work from the beginning right when you uh you know when you're a physician you don't just go into the operating room and start operating you you go to med school and then you do residency and then you do fellowship uh and so the same goes for for running for office and so you know that would be you know my biggest caution uh and in closing uh you know in closing uh, i just want to thank you know you and and to all of us impact and my friend you know, Sanjay Puri for, for having me uh, today and, and look forward to continuing uh, our partnership. Thank you. And could you just as a footnote, uh, what would you comment on what uh, President Biden said the other day that Indians of uh, Americans of India are speaking over America? Well, I think it's true. I think it's true. We are and we will and we'll continue to uh, look, you know, I don't take as much issue as, as some other, you know, Republicans are because frankly, it's true now. You know, if you remember when he was a senator, he, he sort of took on an Indian accent and said you couldn't go to a 7-Eleven, uh, you know, with without. Mataka, Mataka, I think Mataka, that also. was a, a joke in poor taste. Uh, but look, let's not take some of these things too seriously. I think that, you know, we can be lighthearted uh, a little bit. But but look, I, I don't, you know, buy as much stock into that as, as others. Thank you so much, Senator Antani, for your thoughts and your don'ts. Uh, once I think this particular don't you kind of highlighted initially also in the opening comments that uh, don't think of you know straight off you know running for Senate and all. The path is work hard, persevere, and do all the do's which have been mentioned, but don't you know set your sights on a target which is maybe if not unrealistic, uh, but uh, which may which may the probability of which may be low. Possibility could be there, right? But right. life is about possibility versus probabilistic thinking. So what you're saying is that possibilities may be there, but if you want to play the surer game, go the path of probability. Thank you so much, Senator Antani. Uh, may I now invite uh, Assemblywoman woman Jennifer Rajkumar for your, again, two closing comments, uh, your closing thoughts. And before your closing thoughts, again, what are the don'ts or any caution that you would suggest to any fellow uh, on this journey right now or contemplating to get into public service or electoral politics down the line what are some don'ts those we've figured out more or less or we we can see they'll come so what could be some don't or don'ts and then second your overall wrap-up comments please i would say don't overreact if you're entering politics or public service there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. And if you're attacked or things are difficult, it may not always be the right thing to throw a punch. As Bill Clinton once said in an interview, politics is organized for two sides to fight each other, but most change actually happens simply by getting along. So that is something to keep in mind as you go along is not always to overreact. I would always, I would also say uh, approach public service with humility, um, even though it can be intense and there can be a lot of pressure on you. It's Women's History Month, so I'm gonna quote a great American, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring in a folding chair. 
<laughs> so there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. It's going to be hard sometimes to get in there and to get the position you want. But don't give up. Bring in your folding chair to the table and approach it with a sense of humility. Because if you keep at it, one day you will get a seat at that table. Um, so that's what I have to say in closing. And I also just want to thank our incredible host, Mr. Sachdeh. You asked such wonderful questions. And also to US Impact for bringing us together. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Jennifer, for your, for your wonderful answers. I, I mean, the, the conversation that we had. Uh, I mean, it, it helps, you know, our audiences. And please keep your questions coming. We are in the last round, but we would love to still get your thoughts coming in. Uh, before I move on to Sam with the same two questions, right, the two part, uh, I just wanted to comment on the points that you mentioned, Assemblywoman. One, don't react, have humility. Uh, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. It's like that when life hands you a lemon, make lemonade in that sense. So keep going, keep going, don't react. Persevere. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. I think uh, brilliant messages both from Senator Antani and from you, the uh, two folks who may be contemplating or who are already. I mean, see, even if we are ourselves deep into this process ourselves, it's always refreshing to hear views from other peers on this journey with us. So thank you so much for your thoughts. May I please invite now Sam Shim for your thoughts, sir. Once again, the don'ts, if any, and your wrap up thoughts on the conversation topic of the day. Good, good. I think uh, uh, Jennifer and Niraj brought up some excellent points. Uh, I wanted to bring up one additional point in terms of cautions to share. Uh, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is there is a tremendous personal sacrifice in running for office or being involved in the political process. And it's not something that often uh, people think about when they decide to run or get involved in politics. So, you know, Asian Americans and Indian Americans, especially, we are all very family oriented. You know, we care about our family, if our family comes first, but it's gonna involve some sacrifice. And I'm sure all of us on this panel can talk about, can come up, you know, can just spend hour after hour of, of stories of, you know, their experiences and some of the pitfalls and uh, the challenges they've had to navigate. So I think that's something that's very important. Uh, to truly understand what sacrifices you're going to make for your family. It could be something small like childcare, or it could be something major like uh, causing yeah, unfor unfortunate divisions within your family or just time away. So th these are very important uh, things to share. Uh, as I said before, I think there are wonderful training programs out there for anyone who wants to run for office. There's Republican and Democratic uh, training programs, and there's also training programs that specifically target Asian Americans and Indian Americans. So uh, just just as a caution, just make sure you get involved in these training programs because it really helps out. Uh, it, there's great tools that help out uh, to help better develop coalitions with others, to do power mapping. You know, these trainings are wonderful uh, and it's very important because we want to see more diversity in the political process. Uh, in the United States, uh, if you count all the Asian Americans, we represent 1% of all elected officials. And Asian Americans overall are far more than 1% of the electorate. So we are underrepresented on both sides of the political aisle. And we would like to change that. You know, I think that's very important. Uh, but we see uh, so many people stepping up across the country, uh, not just at the federal and state level, but at the very local level. So we are beginning to see the tide turning. Uh, I think it's wonderful. I think uh, what's also great is I, I believe all of us on this call, we're willing to mentor and spend time with any Indian American who wants to run for office. So, you know, reach out to us and reach out to others, uh, especially if you're new to the political process. And uh, my final closing thought is, I just wanna say thank you to US Impact for hosting this panel today. This is wonderful. Uh, you, you've got put together an excellent group of panelists who I respect. And uh, this was a wonderful opportunity to talk to everyone here. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your comments. And uh, interesting to say, yeah, you highlighted very important that amongst the don'ts is that figure out that don't get into the game unless you can manage the sacrifice 
right or be it on your family front or a professional front etc uh definitely that's a wise counsel absolutely uh, and <clears throat> the point that he highlighted also you've been laying emphasis again and again i can see on the aspect of training and training programs and mentoring thank you so much for your offer and suggestion that uh you know you'll be happy in fact i think almost all on this panel would be and us india political action committee absolutely also we do try and engage and mentor or contribute in whichever way we can lend our shoulders uh, or our thoughts uh, or learnings with folks be who are be who are already in the public space or who are wanting to get into public service and uh, electoral politics absolutely in fact that's a good reminder that that should be a strong do for everyone be it whatever side of the aisle and i think that was a question i put to adi also that what could he do to kind of you know generate another 50 or 100 you know elected uh, legislators be it at whichever level but that's the kind of thought we got to go, go into thank you so much sir for your thoughts may i now come to adi for your concluding thoughts sir and once again anything you would have to say on the don't side of it any caution any red flag uh for uh, asian americans indian americans who are getting into politics or who are already into politics one and second your wrap-up comments before i get there may i please take uh, a comment from a viewer again ajay kothari dr kothari is saying neeraj and others are right indian americans have so far contributed far in excess of the recognition they have gotten we don't want to take over but do want to contribute the most and good don't buy neeraj ji thank you so much dr kothari a uh, pleasure always to hear from uh, a feedback from our audiences and engage and to see that we got them engaged adi sir the floor is yours well thank you again uh, for having me of course uh it's been a pleasure i've been on a couple panels now and i'm hoping to come back again another time uh when it comes to the process of getting involved with politics and public service the number one mistake that i find even in an interpersonal capacity first question that people ask you is Oh, well, you're doing that. Well, that's great. That's amazing. That sounds cool. How much money do you make? And that's the moment that you've already lost. If you think about politics and public service as a pathway to making money, then you're not in it for the right reasons, first of all. And then second of all, uh, you, there, there is no purpose to you wanting to take that pathway. Uh, if you want to look at it from you know a different perspective, uh, the world of politics and public service is more about prestige and having the power to make um, things happen and, and have the influence to make things happen in a positive way. And if you think anything uh, different from that, then um, it may not be the right path for you. Uh, when it comes to people that are running for office, I think that we have some great folks on this panel that can speak much better to that, uh, who have run for public office successfully, uh, who have found a way to make that happen. That is absolutely one pathway to making sure that you have a voice and making sure that the Indian American community is well represented. Something that I do want to touch on uh, that is a do uh, for even those that may want to run for office one day as well is to think about the idea of being involved with either a political party, finding your way to Capitol Hill, whether that's during college or even afterwards uh, through the uh, fellowships that are available, many, many fellowships available. People may not even recognize them. Uh, these are things that we can probably all help you guide uh, your way to or you know maybe just go to Google. Uh, but also uh, there are many people, for example, like Nair Tenen, who we talked about today. Uh, or Seema Varma, uh, or others who have never ran for public office, but have had very influential roles in decision-making in our country, that have shaped uh, the policy of our country. And, uh, and there are ways to be able to do that if you don't find uh, running for office to be appealing to you. And that does not mean that you can't find a way to also serve, uh, whether it is uh, in the federal government at the state level. Um, I also had a unique opportunity to get appointed uh, by Governor Rick Snyder to serve on a state commission in Michigan. Uh, there was a pathway for me to do that in a uh, fellowship that I did for a year at the uh, at Michigan State University, uh, which uh, allowed me to find uh, different resources that could help me guide my way to that particular appointment. Uh, I bring up Michigan State, maybe amongst my Ohio State uh, friends here on this panel, so we can find some common ground and something that we can dislike together as a University of Michigan grad. Uh, but really, uh, it's about bringing people together in moments like this whether that's uh, different universities, different political parties, uh, or you know, even different identities within the Indian American community, which I find to be a big fault as well. You think about yourself sometimes as good as you're out there at Punjabi or Tamilian or Telugu or something along those lines, when really we need to stay united as a front and also work with the broader Asian Pacific American coalition that we can create to continue to have that voice that we need to represent. So I'll leave you on that note. Thank you so much. 
Th thank you so much, Adi. I just wanted to comment on your point, but we do have a comment coming in from one of our viewers. Vikram Singh Chauhan says, great panel, have been a regular on this Saturday panel hosted by the US India Political Action Committee and Image India. Thanks, Robin the Sajdeh. Thank you so much, Vikram. Yes, you have been a regular uh, often, uh, and you are a part curator of this whole panel and the US India Political Action Committee. It's a pleasure, of course, to, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the panel which makes the host you know, draw out things from the panel, uh, you know, because uh, it's the thoughts which lead in. Thank you so much, Vikram. And of course, thanks so much to the panel. Before I conclude, yeah, Adi, as you were mentioning, it's an interesting don't which you mentioned about money. And I think in this, the don'ts, uh, each one of you has highlighted something very interesting, I think, which is not much, you know, mentioned or talked about. So Adi's point is that don't think about money if you're getting into public service or don't look at it as a way to make money. Get that out if you want to. Uh, Sam mentioned about sacrifice, you know, to be aware of the sacrifices that you have to make if you want to get into public service. If you are not able to, then don't. Uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, on the don't, don't give up, like bring, a, you know, bring a folding chair to the table, make lemonade if life hands you lemon. And uh, Senator Antani mentioned absolutely aim right. I mean, aim, go for local or uh, the local grassroots and then grow up, aim for the Congress or the governorships. Though, of course, it also means that the possibility could be there, but the probability is low. So hit where the probability is better and then work up. Though we, we've seen that, you know, there have been folks who've gone straight, straight and up there, right? But the probability and life moves more by probability perhaps rather than possibility. So thank you so much, each one of our distinguished panel. It's been a true pleasure and honor for me to host you. Thank you so much for our audience. Too. Thanks so much for our, uh, th thanks so much to our panel. Thank you so much, Senator Antani. Th thank you so much, Assemblywoman uh, Rajkumar. Thank you so much, Mr. Sam Shim. Thank you so much, Adi Sati. It's been a true pleasure to have you with us on this yes. panel. Folks, uh, this was the Saturday noon hour on the March 6th of 2021. Uh, thank you for popping in, checking in, waving by, giving your comments and views. As you see, we put together. And once again, of course, thanks to the US Impact and Imagine India team, Santino, Mr. Santino, uh, Mr. Prasu, and others. And of course, Dolly and Sanjay, the chairman of US India Political Action Committee, Vikram Singh Chauhan, uh, a co-founder, Dolly Kapoor, as I mentioned. Uh, all of us together help make this uh, day happen every day, every week. This was the 28th episode uh, of the Saturday Noon Hour. We look forward to meeting up with you next Saturday, same time, same day, another day. Till then, thank you so much. Have a good day. The broadcast ends now.